Record. So, um, so we'll be looking at our test on Thursday. Then, um, it'll probably be four problems, possibly five. I really doubt that. It'll probably just be four, uh, and it'll be covering Chapter Eleven, which is beams, uh, shear, shear, and uh, bending moment diagrams. And then we'll be getting into twelve, which is also dealing with beam. Um, talking about bending moment and um, also shear. And then the last aspect will be chapter 13, just pieces of 13 where we're dealing with uh, combined stresses. And then the last aspect was more circle, okay? So um, you can count on problems from each of those chapters. And if you do a, if you do a problem out of let's say chapter 12 or uh, 13, you may also need to do a shear moment diagram to be able to get your bending information. So I guess I'll just open it up to questions and see if anybody has any questions. If they'd like to work a problem or two, we can do that, okay? And I would think also Thursday morning, if you guys really have a question you want to look at, I can do something on the board as well, but I want to make sure that you have enough time to take the test, which we should, so. Let's uh, look, let, let me open it up to questions, see if there's anybody wants to do anything. Max, you said you were in pretty good shape. Yeah, if there's any out of chapter 12 that we haven't done yet, is it possible that we could do one of those? Yeah, sure. Uh, let me, I mean, even if we've done them, it's probably not a bad thing to do them over. Do you have one in particular? No. Um, let me look at something real quick, okay, while you guys are thinking. Anybody else that wants to pull something up too, let me know. Let me look at what I've got and let me see if we've got some things we can look at. I, mean, I think we've done most of those actually, but I don't know. Let me see. Let me see. I'm not really seeing any in particular, unless you have one. <laughs> Let's look at, uh, maybe let's look at 33. How's that sound? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So this is dealing with, a, um, this is out of chapter 12. Uh, it's dealing with shear. 
But we haven't done a lot. I mean, we've done more with bending moment, and I think that you guys are pretty okay with that. Uh, but this would be a shear problem. So, and it also refers you to a framing kind of thing. So um, this is kind of a good one. So 33 asks you to use the framing plan and, and the loads given in exercise 18. And they want you to calculate maximum shear stress for a typical two by 10 joist for both a 12 inch and a 16 inch spacing. So we'll go to the, uh, we'll look at that first for the um, 16 inch spacing. And um, then we'll do the, uh, then we'll do the 12 inch spacing. So we have to look at uh, problem, uh, problem 18. So let's look at 18. So they show you the framing plan on 18 and notice that you have um, for the 16 inch spacing, you've got uh, a span of, um, well, first of all, we got two by tens. Okay. And we're at 16 inches on center. And the span on this guy is 12 and a half feet. Okay, does everybody see where I'm getting that information? That's back on page uh, 418. Everybody okay with that? Yeah, I see it. Okay. So, um, so uh, let's see. So we also know that this has got a load rate of 60 pounds per square foot. Okay. So the first thing we need to do is figure out um, what our uh, load is on our beam. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna figure out the actual load on that beam. And then we'll figure out the load rate for the beam itself, okay? So the load rate, the load is gonna be the tributary area of that joist. So those joists are 12 and a half feet. So that's gonna be the length, 12 and a half feet times the trip, the, um, amount that it's taking left or right of that joist. So that joist is uh, 16 inches on center, right? So that means that joist is responsible for eight inches either side. So it's gonna be 16 inches divided by 12 to get that into feet, okay? So this is my tributary area right here. The span length times the width left and right. Does everybody okay with that? Yeah. So then we multiply that by the load value, which is 60 pounds per square foot. And let's see what we get. So I'm coming up with a thousand. Does anybody get that number? Verify that for me. That's what I got. Okay. So what would the unit on that be? Well, you have 60 pounds per square foot of dead and live load. And then this is uh, an area, so this would be square feet. So square feet cancels out square feet. So this would be total pounds. So what this is telling me is that that joist, one of those joists is responsible for 1,000 pounds, okay? But that's spread out over uh, 12 and a half feet. So the load rate across this thing we're going to divide that by 12 just to see that it's distributed equally, okay? So let's divide that by 12. Twelve and a half. <laughs> I did it 12 in my calculator. I had it right. 
Okay, so that should be 80 pounds. So that's gonna be an 80 pound per foot load rate, okay? So what we're gonna do now is construct a uh, shear diagram. We don't need a shear moment diagram, just a shear diagram. Okay, so let me, uh, let me grab my little tool here. Okay, so I'm gonna have a one guy here. This is my beam. Well, actually, we do it with a rectangle. Rectangle might be a little bit easier. And what we're gonna have here is, um, we're gonna assume we got two reactions, one on the back side of the wall and one on the front side of the wall. And this guy is loaded like this. And the load rate on that is 80 pounds per foot. So we have a reaction here and a reaction here. What we need to do is come up with a shear diagram on this. So the first thing we need to do is solve reactions, right? Oh, this. This is a span of 12 and a half feet. Is everybody with me so far? Yeah. Okay, so how do we solve reactions? We should be able to do this. So what do we have for reactions? Sum of forces in Y equals zero. If we call this A and we call this B, we've got reaction A plus reaction B minus 80 pounds times 12 and a half gives us 1,000, correct? Anybody with me? Yeah. Okay. So what this tells us is, now can you guys tell me what the load is on each reaction or what the reaction is due to this load? Anybody know? Without doing a moment. Wouldn't it just be 500 up? It would be because this thing is completely just distributed across this, right? Mm -hmm. So there's no concentrated point loads that are coming down weirdly. So that, yeah, that would just say that. Now, if we did a moment, we'll just do a moment real quick to prove that. If you did a moment at A, it should give you the same thing that you just said, Max. So we would have, um, we know that we've got 1,000 acting down in the middle. So that would be what, six and a quarter? minus 12 and a half RB, that's gonna equal zero. So what that should give us then, should get us 500. So what we should have here is when we take RBV, or yeah, it's a vertical, that's going to be a minus 6,250 divided by a minus 1250. So this is exactly what you said. It's going to be 500. Okay, is everybody okay with that? So when you have, when you have this distribution like this and there's no other point loads coming down on it, um, pretty much it should be equal. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, so I'm gonna, let me go ahead and I'm gonna delete this out. And uh, now that we know the reactions, we can solve the shear, okay?
And then once we solve the shear, then we can solve the shear stress. Okay, so we know that this is, uh, let's, I should have just done that too while I was at it. We know that each each uh, area here or each reaction is 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 responsible for 500 500 pounds. So what's happening on our shear? We're starting out at 500. What's happening as we step across this beam? Staying constant or is it changing? Staying constant. Well, this is dropping, 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 right? So what we're getting is a diagonal amount of shear like this. This would be 500 minus 1,000 gives us, oops, let me undo that gives us negative 500, then when we add 500 to that, we're back at zero. So that's my shear diagram. Is everybody okay with that? Yeah. So what is the point of maximum shear? And what is the value of maximum shear? I'm asking you two questions. Where is maximum shear? And what is the value of maximum shear? Come on, guys. <laughs> well, maximum shear occurs at the two reactions, right? And its value is what? 500. 500, plus or minus, right? Because it really doesn't matter. But mm -hmm. that would be in terms of pounds. So we have 500 pounds of shear that we have to deal with. So this beam has to develop shear according to that okay so we're using a uh what type of member is this this is a what uh two by ten right it's a two by ten so what is the equation for shear anybody remember for shear stress What is that? Well, look it up. You don't know it. Go back to page 413. 413. What do we see? 3V over 2A. Okay. 3V, let me, uh, 3V over 2A. Now, there's another equation there, too, which says what? VQ over IB. Are these equivalent equations? I mean, they should be. Well, they're only equivalent if you've got a rectangular cross section. Oh yeah, that's right. Do you have a rectangular cross section? Two by 10. Yeah. Yeah, we do. We don't need to use this equation because that's a lot harder equation to use because then you have to solve that static moment of area, okay? And of course, we'd have to get into the moment of inertia. So this one's going to be the way to go on this one because it's a rectangular cross section. Now, if you have a non-rectangular cross section, you can't use this. You would have to use this guy, okay? Like an I-beam or a T-bar or something like that. That's going to give you a whole different different situation. Okay, so recognizing that uh, we have everything we need, don't we? What is V in this equation?
It's the shear due to the load, right? 500. What's A here? The area. Okay, so what is that? Two times 10? So 20. It is not. All right, this is a wood member, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we have to go back to Appendix D and figure out what the actual area is because this is dressed lumber. You have to assume that when you ever time you're dealing with anything like that, that would be a kind of a wooden joist thing. So go back to Appendix D where it deals with timber design. And we see page uh, 644, uh, table D1. So we need to get the area from there. Okay. So this would not be 2 by 10 because this thing at a two by 10 is actually one and a half by 11 and a quarter. But the area is in that chart. You guys verify this. It looks like it's 1688 inches squared. See that for two by 12, for two by 10, I see 13.88. All right, yeah, I was looking in the wrong one, thank you. That's why I wanted you to verify it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's 13.88, Max? Yeah. Okay. And that would be the area in square inches, correct? Mm -hmm. So in this case, the shear stress that develops in this is going to be 300, or three rather, not 300, which three and two are just constants. So there is no unit value associated with those. Three times 500 pounds divided by two times the area, which is 13.88. And that'll be the amount of shear that we are expecting on this uh, joist. So let's see what we come up with. 500 times 3 divided by 2 times 13.88. Looks like uh, I'm coming up with 54. What would be the unit on that? It's stress. Stress is always in a unit of force divided by cross-sectional area, right? So in this case, it would be pounds divided by cross-sectional area, which is an in inches. So this is PSI. Okay. So what if your allowable stress on this joint, let's say building code told you the allowable stress was uh, 60 PSI for shear. Are we okay? Yeah. Yeah, because we're below it. All right. Is everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. All right. So the, the second part of this problem is just dealing with the other joist that is actually, it's got a different spacing. And um, it's got a, a 12 inch spacing and a different span. So you would do it exactly the same way. Do you guys, you need to see that or not? Ah, uh, sure. Okay. So we got to go back to the framing plan then on 18. So we did the ones that are two by tens, uh, 16 inches on, on center. So I'm going to, I'm going to um, erase all this stuff. Uh, give me a sec here. So I'm going to erase this. And all of this stuff is not valid any longer for what we've got going on. Actually that, that is, I'm going to, I'm going to move that to okay. All right, so let's see. I'm going to put that area. Let me move that area out of here because we're going to need that area again. So I'm going to move that area up here. So we know that the area for this, so we don't have to look it up because it's the same thing. We're still dealing with a two by 10 member. The area for this guy is this. Okay, so we've got that two by 10 member.
Okay, so what has changed here in this picture? This is uh, not a 16 inch on center, it's, it's what? Well, it's 12 inches on center. <clears throat> and is the span different? We're looking at 418. The span is now what, 16 feet? Six inches. Mm -hmm. Okay, but the uh, load rate stays the same. The uh, the dead load, live load stuff, right, stays the same, correct? Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna come up with our load rate again and then we're gonna work that out. So in this case, it's gonna be your tributary area, which is 16 and a half feet times that joist, which is uh, carrying half the load left and half the load right of it. So it's gonna be six inches on one side, six inches on the other. So it's gonna be 12 inches and we're gonna convert that to feet. 12, so it's one foot times that times 60 pounds per square foot. So this will give us the total amount of load that this beam is, is experiencing. And we got 12 and a half times one times 60. So this beam is actually carrying 990 pounds total. Okay, that's the total amount. But the load rate on this guy would be distributed over 16 and a half feet. So what we would have is 60 pounds per foot. Okay, Does everybody okay that? So we did it the exact same way we uh, we're doing the other one, right? So we need to figure out the reactions and then we can figure out the shear, okay? So what about the reactions? Can you do that without, well, let's just draw, we'll draw a diagram. I mean, it doesn't hurt drawing these diagrams the more you see it. So we have, this time we have a beam supported left, supported right. This guy has a load right across him. of 60 pounds per foot. Got reactions and we need to develop again, we need to develop a shear number. We need to design this for maximum shear, okay? So who can tell me what's going on here? What about the, re what about the reactions? Anybody tell me what those reactions are going to be without going through the mat, the, the statics? How much load is this beam carrying total? Total amount of load is what? 90, uh, 990. Okay, so what does that tell us about each reaction then? It's going to be half of that. It's going to be half of that. Now again, you can run through the statics if you want, but we should be able to know that pretty pretty readily, okay? So you might, does anybody need me to run through that again or are we okay with that? We're good? Mm -hmm. Okay, so shear, we start out with shear, uh, we go from zero to 495, and then again, this thing's not going to remain constant. It's going to step across and it's going to go diagonally, right? And it's going, yeah. at, it's going at a 60 pound per foot load rate. So what that means over a span of, oh, I forgot to put that span number, but it's 16 and a half feet. By the time you get over here, down here, 
it's going to be negative 990. So 990 negative plus 495 should give us a negative. Oops. I hate that when I do that. Uh, negative 495. So 495 plus 495 brings us back to zero. So what's my, oops, I don't want shear. What I want is the amount of shear is 495. And it doesn't matter whether we call it negative or positive because we're just calculating for the maximum. So remember, we look at the absolute value. Is everybody good with that? Yeah. So what is the shear stress that is developing in this? We can use that same equation. 3V over 2A, is that correct? Yeah. Okay, so everything just really plugs in very, uh, very readily. <laughs> it's not bending. Okay, so shear stress is three times V. V is 495 divided by two times the area, which we've saw, already solved from the chart. And we will notice something here. Looks like uh, 53 something. 53.3. Okay, you guys good that with that? Yeah. Okay. Any questions? That was uh twelve problem twelve thirty-three that referenced you back to that framing plan. So that's a really, really good problem, actually. And you could also, if you needed to, I think it actually asks you in 18 to do the bending moment on that. So you could solve bending moment as well, but you'd have to do a moment diagram to solve that. So in this case, we only needed to do the shear piece of it, which was pretty cool. So that was a good problem. That was a very practical um, kind of thing you might see in reality, even might see on a test, something like that. Okay. So that was a good, that was a good, uh, good, good thing. All right. So what else do we want to take a look at? Actually, real quick, where it says the uh, load rate, yep. 990s, like the total load rate. Yeah, this is not the load rate right here. Uh, this is the total load. Okay. okay. When I take that and divide it by 16 and a half, that's your load rate. Okay. So a rate is going to be something per something. Got it. But this, if I just, if I just didn't put this here, then that wouldn't be a load rate. Then that would be your total load. Okay. Okay. So remember, uh, because this is what your dead load, live load um, is referenced for for um you know code tributary area times that number gives you the total amount of load that that member is experiencing but because we know that the way this is being distributed we're using that uh, we're creating a load rate because this is a uniformly distributed load okay so i mean that's that's how we're dealing with this one they're not always going to be that way um, but if you have concentrated loads, you you couldn't solve those typically. Those would probably be given to you, okay? Unless you had like a column coming down and you had to solve for the amount of load on that column. I mean, you might have to do that, but we wouldn't do anything that, okay? So that makes sense, Max? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. That was a good question. Okay. All right, anything else uh, out of chapter 12, 11, 13? That's okay with combined stresses. Those probably tend to be the harder things to deal with, but um, I think chapter I think chapter eleven and twelve are pretty straightforward as long as you've done a, the you know enough of the problems to feel good with that. But uh, a thirteen is also kind of straightforward if you just keep everything together. But we can do whatever you'd like to do. Okay, this is your time.
You guys, I'm going to look at something on 13 and see if there's something I want to make me take a look at, okay? All right. And then you guys can think about something if you want to look at it. Let me, uh, let me grab something here. You said for the test we're going to be able to use all our notes? Yeah. Well, you're going to be able to use your book. Okay. Yeah, because, um, yeah, there's no point in creating a... Uh, um, you know, cheat sheet or anything, because everything's going to be in the book, because you may have to look up stuff in tables. So I'll just let you use your book, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. All right. Let me look at something here and see if there's one that we might want to solve. How about number six? Let's look at number six out of chapter 13. This is a, comp, a combined stress problem. It's actually a really good one. Let me clean up my screen and we'll run through it. Okay, so we are on, I'm on page, um, uh, 458, and I'm looking at problem six. So it shows you a C clamp that is tightened until the force uh, is equal to a thousand pounds. And they want you to calculate the maximum and minimum combined stress on section AA, uh, which is uh, the outside edge of that C clamp. And um, we're not going to do it. We're not going to redo it with a rectangular cross section. We'll just do it with a single cross section. So um, what we basically have, you have to think about what's going on there. So we have a bending stress, and we also have a, um, a normal stress. I'm just going to draw a little piece of this thing. So this is kind of like the upper part of the clamp and down here is where the, the thing is, is happening. But we're looking at a cross section here and that cross section is, uh, let's see, let's see if I can draw a cross section here. Okay, so this is representing uh, the cross section of that. And I would basically have a neutral axis running through it like this which would be running through my circle, basically like that, something like that. You guys get the idea, I think. And we know, so I'm gonna get here in a minute. Let's see. Okay, so you have to look at this picture and think about it. Um, Notice in the clamp down below, they show you a force. Whoops. I'm not drawing the whole clamp, but what you would see down here, this, this piece is coming around to the jaws down here. And they show you a P force going this way and a P force going this way. So that translates into a P force here and here. Okay, does everybody get the idea? Does everybody care that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let me uh, let me make this picture a little bit better. I'm gonna delete a couple things here. Get rid of this. Get this guy a little bit cleaned up. So we know. that we have a force here of a thousand pounds acting like uh, this way. 
and a thousand pounds acting this way. Okay. So that's putting that, that's putting that outside part of the C clamp in tension, correct? Right? That's in tension. Yeah. But down here, because this thing is separated by a distance, let's see, we got a distance of one and a half inches. It's also pushing. So we have a thousand pounds kind of rotating it like that, right? So we're getting a moment that's developing here. And that's going to put the top of this thing in compression and the bottom of it in tension. Does everybody agree with that? So this is going to be compression and this is going to be tension at the bottom. Due to that eccentric, we have an eccentric moment developing there. Does everybody see that? Are we okay with that? Yeah. Okay. So the normal stress is defined as what? P over A. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I was wondering if that was going to happen. Okay, so A is this guy has a what, one inch diameter? Yeah. Let's see. One inch diameter. So our area is pi D squared over four. Okay, so let's see what we come up with here. Let's see. Pi divided by four. I get like uh, 0 0.785. It carries out a little bit further if you want, but that's probably close enough. It would round up to that. Is everybody okay with that? We all right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the force or the, the stress on this is going to be 1,000 pounds of tension divided by the area. Let's see what we come up with here. Looks like uh, 12, uh, 73.2. Oops, 0.2, not 3. PSI. Does that sound right? Yeah. Is this a compressive stress or a tensile stress? Well, the force is tension, right? Yeah. So this has to be a ten this has to be a tensile stress that develops, right? So yes. we're going to consider tension positive. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So now we also have a moment that's developing due to the eccentric load and the neutral axis. 
So the moment is equal to P times E. Okay, so what is P? That's the force, right? Yeah. And that would be a thousand. What is E? E is the distance of eccentricity. So that's from the neutral axis to where the force is being applied. So what is E? Wouldn't it just be half of that? Half of what? Um, Your force is actually out here. Okay. So the distance from the neutral axis to that force is what? Wait, is the 1.5, I'm just confused on uh, what that's. That's, that's your distance from the, the force to the edge of the cylinder. Oh. So E is the distance from the force line of action to the neutral axis. Okay. So what is E? Well, if you're one and a half from the force line of action to the edge of the cylinder, you have to go another half inch because this is a, half, a one inch diameter. So E is actually gonna be two inches. Okay. Okay? Yeah. And that would give us 2,000 inch pounds, right? Yeah. Okay. So bending moment is defined as M C over I. We just solved M. So what is C? That's the distance from the neutral axis to the edge fiber. That would be what, from here to here? Your diameter is one inch, right? So it doesn't C have to be one half inch? Yeah. Okay. So we need to solve I for a circle. All right, so we have to go back to chapter seven. And you'll notice that I for a circle is pi r to the fourth divided by four. So that's pi times one half to the fourth divided by four. Let's see what we come up with there. Probably going to be a pretty small number. Uh, 0 0.05. Uh, okay. You you hold on a minute. I, I think yours is right. I got it. <laughs> Let me check mine. Okay. I didn't get that at first, but I'm pretty sure you were right, Max. Yeah. Not quite five. I mean, you could round that. I actually have a uh, zero four nine one. If you want to round it, or uh, not even that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Inches to the fourth. We wouldn't be that much difference. Okay. So now we can solve bending stress. 
M, which is 2,000 inch pounds times C, which we said is one half divided by I. Okay, let's see what we come up with. Uh, let's see. Would you guys get 20,000 something? 408, yeah. 408? 20,408. Huh. Okay. Mine's, I didn't get that. Hold on a minute. <laughs> I'm just having all kinds of trouble there. Huh. I'm getting like three six two twenty thousand three six six. Are you using point four nine point zero four nine one? Hold on. I think you're the only one here. <laughs> okay, I got it. Okay. So <clears throat> what we should know is that that bending stress is going to be plus or minus because it's going to be compressive on one side and tension on the other. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if we do our, if we set up our chart, the top, which would be this guy. Now I got T and C. I should let me label this differently. That's compression up here. Um, let me erase something because I. I'm going to call this the A side and this the B side. Okay. So what we're going to have is the A side of that and the B side of that. We've got a normal stress, we've got a bending stress, and so therefore we're going to have a combined stress. So the normal stress is a tensile, so that's just going to be a plus 12, 73.2, and that guy's experiencing that both top and bottom. So A and B, top and bottom. So the bending stress, if we look at how this is bending, we're saying it's compression on the top and uh, tension on the bottom due to that um, um, eccentric load. So we're gonna have compression on the top of negative 20,366.6 and tension on the bottom 20,366. So when we add those, That'll get us what we need. Just make sure that we do the uh, the right signs. Yeah. Well, I'm just having all kinds of issues today. Okay, I get a negative. 19093.4 psi and this is going to be a positive it's going to be a tensile looks like a positive 21 Six three nine point eight psi. So the top, or you might call it the outside, is experiencing compression. The inside is experiencing com uh, tension. So this is a uh, compressive stress. This is a tensile stress. 
that's your combined values. Okay, that was a good problem because you really had to piece a lot together and that diagram isn't as straightforward as some of these other things. So it's kind of a good one to look at. And what they further ask you is if you had a rectangular cross section that was one and a half inches deep and one and a one and a half inch wide, you could solve that assuming that the one and a half is going this way and the half inch is going this way. So you would really uh, actually this wouldn't change at all in that equation. Just C would change and then your area would change, moment of inertia. So it would be basically the same thing with just different numbers. Any questions on that one? That was kind of a good one. I know we didn't do that on the board the other day, but I, it's, I like to always work that one. No questions, guys? Nope. So any questions uh, in general about the test or any other problems that you want to work? If, if not, then I'm going to probably stop the share. Feel good. Okay. Anybody else? Max, you're the only one that's answering anything, so I'm, <laughs> I don't know. Irvin, you got any issues? most part i'm pretty good with everything okay feel pretty comfortable with all right this. and you got to get your deck project done and then uh, that other little lab yeah those will be due on thursday jacob how about you feel good about it okay all right mitch um it's a work in progress uh to say the least but okay. um we're getting there yeah oh, okay any questions you want to look at any any problems no i mean this was all pretty helpful definitely on thursday if we went over a little bit more in the 13 that would probably okay we're not we're not gonna have a ton of time so what i'm gonna suggest is if you guys want to work on a problem on thursday you might even want to email me what you want to work so i can get set up you know we're ready to roll okay gotcha and then uh, that way, you know, I, I, I mean, I, you know, we got three hours and I can actually, I'm going to be there later. So if it goes a little longer, that's not a problem, but it's not that you'll need three hours for the test. I want to at least give you two. So I don't want to spend more than about an hour going over stuff. So the quicker we can get in and out and doing that stuff, the better. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Um, I'm, Done with the share then, unless anybody has questions, you can stick around. I'll stick around for a few minutes. Otherwise, I do have office hours tomorrow from eight o'clock until one o'clock. So I would be available to do a Zoom session. And actually I could probably do something in the evening as well. So I'm around quite a bit. So all you gotta do is contact me, okay? All right. All right. Okay guys, well, good luck. Uh, Study some stuff, go through some, you know, the easiest way to study for this test is just do as many problems as you can, okay? Rework them, uh, just rework them. Don't look at the answers that you did before and then just check, you know, what you've got. So that way, that's a good, that's a good way of studying it. Just, just work as many problems as you can so you're familiar with the stuff. Might wanna bring a straight edge, compass. If we do a moment, uh, if we do a more circle, Although there are actually are compasses there at the college, so you can probably just borrow some of that stuff. There is straight, yeah, they do have straight edges. They don't have scales though. So you might wanna bring a scale if you're interested. Okay. Anything else then? Nope. All right, guys, I will see you. Uh, contact me if you need it, okay? All right, thanks. Okay. All right, I'll post this up there then.